Live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering DockerCon 2017. Brought to you by Docker and support from its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE here in Austin, Texas at DockerCon 2017. I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host for the two days of live broadcast, Tim Kobielis. Happy to welcome back to the program John Gossman, who is the lead architect with Microsoft Azure, also as part of the keynote this morning. Uh, John had the pleasure of interviewing you two years ago. Uh, you know, we went through the obligatory wait, you know, Microsoft open source, you know, Linux and Windows and everything living together, it's like cats and dogs. Yep. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us again. Yeah, well as I was saying, that's uh, 14 years in cloud years. Yeah. So it's been a lot of change in that time, but thanks for having me again. Yeah, ab absolutely, and yeah, right, you said it was three years that you've been working Microsoft and Docker together, 21 years in the dog or cloud years, if you will. Um, even though I think, I think Docker's more, you know, whales and turtles uh, as, as opposed to, to the dogs, but uh, enough about the cartoons and the animals. Um, wh why don't you give our audience just a, a synopsis of kind, kind of the key messages you were trying to get across uh, in the keynote this morning. Okay, well the very simple message is that what we enabled with this new technology, Hyper-V isolation for Linux containers, is the ability to run uh, Linux containers just seamlessly on Windows using the normal Docker experience. It's just Docker run, you know, BusyBox or Docker run, MySQL or whatever it is, and it just works. And of course, if you know a little more technical detail about containers, you realize that one of the reasons that containers are the way they are is that all the containers on the box normally share a kernel. And so you can run, you know, at a, a canonical Ubuntu on a user space on a Red Hat kernel or vice versa, but Windows and Linux kernels are too different. So if you want to run a Windows container, it's not going to run easily on uh, Linux and vice versa. And you can still get this effect if you want it by uh, also using a virtual machine. But then you've got the management overhead of managing the virtual machine, managing the containers, all the complexity that that involves. You have to get a, a VHD or a AMI or something like that, as well as a container image, and, and you lose a lot of that uh, sort of experience. Yeah, so John, first of all, I have to say congratulations to Microsoft. When the announcement was made that Windows containers were going to be developed, uh, I have to say that I and most of my peers were a little bit skeptical as to how fast that would work through the development cycle, um, probably because you know we have lots of experience and it's always okay. We understand how many man years this usually takes, but you guys hit and were delivering to the betas. Uh, so can you speak to us about where we are with Windows containers and one of the things people want to kind of understand is, compared to like Linux containers, how do you expect the adoption of NAT now that it's generally available to, to roll out? Do I have to wait for the next server refresh, the rest, you know, OS refresh? Uh, you know, how do you expect your customers uh, to, to adopt and embrace? Well, we were able to get this to work so quickly because you remember Docker uh, didn't actually invent containers they took a bunch of kernel primitives that were in Linux and put a really great user experience on it. And I'm not taking anything away from Docker from doing that, because oftentimes in the technology industry it's easy to make something that's complicated, powerful, but not easy to use. And Windows already had a lot of those kernel primitives, the same sort of similar kernel primitives built in. They had a thing called Job Objects, I think when in Windows 2000. And so it was a kind of the same experience. We took the Docker engine, so we got the API, you know, we were using the open source project, so we have complete compatibility, and then we just had to write a basically a new backend, and that's why it was able to come up uh, quite quickly. And now we're in a mode, you know, Windows Server updates the, you know, things more incrementally than we did in the past. So this will just keep on uh, improving as time goes on. Okay, uh, one of the other big announcements in the keynote this morning was Linux Kit, and uh, it was open source project. We actually saw Solomon you know, move it to open source during the keynote. Yeah. Uh, when they laid out the ecosystem support, there's companies like IBM, HPE, uh, you know, Intel, and Microsoft. So, what does that mean for Microsoft? Are you, you are now provider of Linux, or you know, what, 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 how are we supposed to look at this? Yeah, so we're working with all, all the Linux vendors. So yeah. if you saw our, our blog about uh, the, the work we did today, we also have announcements from SUSE and Red Hat and Canonical and the usual uh, uh, people. And one of the things I said in this, in this box is I said, look, there's the, the new model is that you can choose both the Linux container that you, that you want and the kernel that you want to run it on. And so we're open to all, all sorts of things. But we have been working with Docker for a long time uh, on making sure that 
uh, there was a great experience for running Docker for Linux on Windows. This thing called uh, Docker for Windows, which uh, uh, they developed. And we've been helping it. And that's basically an earlier generation of this same Linux technology. So that's, it's just you know, the next step on, on that journey. Yes. Microsoft's pretty well recognized to have a, a robust solution for a hybrid cloud, because of course you've got your Azure stack uh, you know, that you're putting on premises, there's Azure itself, it's really the cloud first methodology that you've been rolling through and you have software as a service. Containers, really anywhere in your environment, baked in anywhere, how, how should we be thinking about this going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one of the points of containers in general, one of the, the attractive parts of containers is that they run everywhere, including from your laptop, to the various clouds, to bare metal, to virtualized environments. And uh, so we have both things. We want Windows containers, where we're, we're the vendor of the container, we want those to work everywhere. And we also, as uh, you know, the vendors of Azure and Azure Stack and just server, system center, and other older uh, enterprise technologies, we want containers to work on all those things. So both directions. I mean, that's kind of the world we're in now, where everything works everywhere. Can you square your container strategy, as reflected in your partnership with Docker, with your serverless computing strategy for Azure Functions? I'm trying to get a sense for Microsoft's overall approach to, to running containers as it relates to the Azure strategy. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in some ways, you can think of this as a serverless functions move, is a step even further, you know? Yeah. You know, used to deploy a hardware machine and install everything on it. Next thing, you have a virtual machine and you install everything. And then you put your code and all the it in a container. And with serverless, with Azure Functions, it's like, well, why do any of that? Just write a function. Now, at the same time, we think there's lots of reasons. I mean, uh, under the covers, all of these PaaS systems going all the way back, that's how Docker started, run a container under the ne underneath the covers. And the same place, you know, not, it's not literally a Docker container, but the same place down in, in Functions has that sort of a capability. And we're uh, you know, certainly thinking about how uh, you know, Docker containers will work in that uh, serverless model in the future. Yeah, one of my core focus areas for Wikibon as, a, as an analyst is looking at developers going more deeply into deep learning and, and machine learning. To what extent is Microsoft already taking you know, its core tools in that area and containerizing them and enabling the access to that functionality through, uh, through serverless APIs and functions and so forth in Azure? Yeah, so on the serverless stuff, I'm not on the serverless team. I, I'm really not qualified to explain everything on there. I do know that like the CNT team has a Docker container that they put the, the bits in. Uh, there's the Azure uh, machine learning team who's been uh, working with a lot of these sort of technologies. I'm just not the right guy okay. to answer that, right. that question. Good. Okay, so as, as you talk to your customers, you know, where does this fit into the whole discussion? Do containers just happen in the background? Is it helping them uh, with some of their application modernization? Does it help Microsoft you know, change the way you re-architect things? Uh, you know, what, what's kind of the practitioner, you know, your ultimate end user viewpoint on this? Well, uh, you know, cloud adoption is at all points in the curve simultaneously, even inside individual companies. So everybody's in a, in a, in a kind of different place. Um, the, Two models that I think people have really concentrated on is on one end, in the past at least, is, is infrastructure, where you just bring your existing applications, and another one would be you know, PaaS, where you rewrite the application for a more modern uh, architecture, more cloud-centric architecture. And containers fit kind of squarely in the middle of that in some respects, because in many ways, and, and primarily, I see Docker containers as a better form of infrastructure. It is an easier, more portable way to get all your dependencies together and, and, and run them everywhere. So a lot of lift and shift work is in there. But once you're in containers, it is also easier to break the components apart and put them back together into, uh, a, into a more microservice-oriented you know, cloud-native model. Yeah, I think that's a great point because right, we've been having this discussion about, okay, there's applications that I'm rewriting, but yeah. then I've got this huge amount of applications that I need some way to, to have the bridge to the future, if you will. That's right. Um, because, I, I don't know, there's one analyst firm that calls it bimodal, but to what customers we talk to in general, um, we don't segment everything we do. We kind of have, you know, I have applications, I have infrastructure, and I need to be able to live across multiple environments. So, um, yeah. 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 Wrapping versus refactoring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they do both, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, I always heard, you know, some people come in and they talk about legacy, and they're, you know, the developers, I'm a developer, right? Developers, we always we want to write everything, and there's a time and place to doing that, but 
the legacy applications are what I refer to. Those are the applications that work. And uh, you, you know, if you don't need to refactor that thing, if you can get it into a container or a virtual machine or however, and get it uh, into that more environment, and then work around it, re-architect it, it's a whole different set of approaches. And it's a, it's a good conversation to have with a customer to understand. I've seen people go both too slow, and I see people refactor their whole thing and then trying to figure out how to get it to work again. Yeah. So Microsoft has a you know gigantic user base. What kind of things are you doing to help kind of educate, uh, help the people that you know had certifications or jobs were you know running Exchange uh, to you know move towards this new kind of world in cloud in general and containers specifically maybe. Well, we have a, a ton of stuff. I'm not familiar with the certification programs myself, yeah. but we certainly have our uh, developer evangelism team out going out training people. We've been trying to improve our documentation. We have a bunch of uh, guidance on cloud migration and, and, and things like that. There is a real uh, challenge, and it's the same problem for our customers and anybody looking at cloud, is to re-educate people who've been working uh, in some other previous mode. Which is another reason, again, why you know, the lift and shift stuff, if you can make it more like it is on, on premise or more like it is on your laptop, it makes that journey a little easier. But we're definitely in one of those points where uh, the industry's changing so fast. I personally have to spend a lot of time, what's going on? What happened today? You know, what's new? Today, coming to the conference, you know, yeah, I learned new things. And you bring up a, a huge challenge that we see. I, I kind of like Docker uh, has their two delivery models. They've got the Community Edition CE and the Enterprise Edition EE. And EE, feels more like traditional software. It's packaged, it's on you know, the regular release cycle, not, you know, CE is, and God, Solomon talked this morning about the edge pieces. It's, can I keep up with every six months or can I have stuff flying at me? Um, people inside of Docker can't keep up with the pace of change that much. Uh, what do you see, I mean, I, I think back to, you know, the major Windows operating system releases that we used to, like the Intel, you know, TikTok yep. uh, releases. It's the pace of change is tough for everyone. How are you helping, you know, with your product development and customers, uh, you know, take advantage, of, take advantage of things and try to keep up with this rapidly changing ecosystem? Yeah, so th this is a constant channel with, with challenge with uh, basically software now. We can't afford to only ever ship things every three years. And at the same time, there's stability. So with the major products like Windows, we have these stable branches where things are pretty much the same uh, going along. And then there's a, you know, active branch where things are coming down and the, and the changes and the updates are coming. Uh, the, I'd say the one biggest difference I'd see between, I've been in the industry for a long time, so say between the 90s and now, is that we have so much, uh, you know, so much of it is actually a service where when something crashes, we get a crash uh, dump and we can, we can uh, debug the thing. And so going out in the field, we have much more uh, capability of debugging what's going on in the customer base than we did 20 years ago. Uh, but other than that, it's, uh, it's just a really hard challenge to uh, both satisfy people that can't have anything to change and everything changing. That's it. All right. John. You've been watching this for a number of years. What do we still have left to do? We come back to DockerCon next year. You know, but we'll have more people. It'll be a bigger event. But you know, what, what's the progression? What kind of things are you looking forward uh, to the, the the ecosystem and, and and yourself and Docker knocking down and moving customers forward with? Yeah. So the, the you know the first year was kind of like what is this thing? Second year was now you know the Docker individual Docker container is uh, there. Now, how do you orchestrate them? Uh, and now we, the next step is like, how do we network these things? Uh, and there's an initiative now to uh, standardize on storage, on how for, for storage systems in Docker containers, uh, monitoring. There's a lot of things that are uh, still going on. We have a long ways to go. On the other side, I think there's another track, which uh, you know, which we we talked about today, which is that virtualization and containers are going to blur and mend. And, and I don't think that seven years from now we're going to be talking about containers or virtual machines. We're just going to be taking some unit of compute. And then there's a bunch of knobs and tweaks that you, get, you want it a little more isolated, you want it a little less isolated, you trade off some performance for some, you know, uh, something else. So business capabilities, in other words, the enterprise architecture framework of business capabilities will be paramount in terms of composing yeah. applications or microservices. From what I understand you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I think where we're going to get to is a model where people, 
we get past this basics of storage and networking and and um, um, model, and start working up the next level. So things like uh, Helm or DCS Universe or uh, 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 source stacks, where you can describe more of an application. It just keeps moving up. And so I think in seven years, we won't be talking so much about this, you know, there'll be some other disruption, right? But it, it, but they won't be talking about this, this virtualization layer as much as building apps again. Uh, like visual composition of microservices. What is Microsoft doing? You say that you long ago entered Microsoft through the Visio acquisition. What's uh, Microsoft doing to enable more visual composition across these functions, across you know, orchestrated, uh, containerized yeah. environments going forward. I think there is some work going on. Um, uh, it's not my area, again, on visual composition, despite the fact that I came from Visio. I kind of got away ago. from that space. Yeah, I'm betraying my age. I remember that period. All right, well, John, <laughs> always a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you so much for joining us for, for this segment. Look forward to watching well, Microsoft thanks for going forward. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll be back with lots more coverage here from DockerCon 2017. You're watching theCUBE.